Good morning everyone and welcome to our service. We hope you had a good week and managed to enjoy some of the interesting weather that we've been having. We hope you're staying safe and healthy and we're really looking forward to being able to meet in person in our church building again. But while we're still meeting together in this way, separated but still joined by what we're singing and hearing, I'm going to be taking us through our service this morning. We'll be starting with a time of worship, a children's message and craft, and then Phil will be leading us through the next section of our sermon series of John. So let's start with a moment of quiet, an opportunity to still our minds and reflect on the weeks we've had and prepare our hearts to receive the words of worship and of scripture from the service this morning. Dear Lord, we are aware that we have so much to be thankful for. We thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives, that we have been given so much when there are those who have so little. We pray that this morning you would set our eyes and hearts on you afresh, that our spirits will be renewed and that we will be filled with your peace and joy through what we experience together. We pray this in your name. Amen.
can stop the Lord Almighty. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb of the Slain. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before Him. Jay. 
chases me down fights to I'm finally the nine and nine I can hurt it I don't deserve it still you give yourself away oh, the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God oh, You're a fool, still your love far from me. And you've been so, so good to me. I found no worth, you paid it all for me. And you've been so, so kind. Shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. You're coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie, you won't tear down. Oh, you're coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. That is our, our prayer, God. Lord, that as we come to meet you this morning here in this place, God, that you will meet us where we are. Lord, we just want to say, God, that we recognize so often we spend so much of our lives running away from you instead of running with you. And Lord, this morning we just say,
for the names of our picnic. Today our story is all about a big picnic. Let's hear it now. Here is Jesus talking to some people. Now you've got to use your imagination here boys and girls because <laughs> because there's only oh can you count them? This one's Jesus here I'll show you. This one's Jesus here. And then we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a little baby. Seven people all listening to Jesus now. In the story there weren't seven people, there weren't 50 people, there weren't a hundred people, there were more than a thousand people, there was 5,000 people and they'd all come to hear Jesus. Look, he's talking to everyone and he's telling them his stories. They stayed all afternoon and at dinner time they were still listening to Jesus. Jesus' friends said, let's tell these people to leave now. They can go and get something to eat. Ah, oh, they don't need to go, said Jesus. But we don't have enough money to buy food for them, said Philip. You're right, said Andrew. And I only know one person who brought food. A little boy here has got five loaves and two fish. That's not enough to feed 5,000 people, they said. But Jesus said, hmm, tell the people to all sit down on the soft grass. Can you count what we have here? We have one, two, three, four, five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus said to God, Dear Lord God, I thank you so much for the, this food. Please bless this food to nourish our bodies and make us have lots of energy so we can carry on listening to your word and to the stories that I've got to tell everyone. Thank you so much for this food, Lord. And that was his prayer. And then all of a sudden, there was enough food for everybody. Everyone had as much food as they wanted. What a miracle. There wasn't just a little bit of food. There was enough food for everyone. So did you enjoy the story of the feeding of the 5,000 people? God is very amazing, isn't he? And he takes care of all our needs. Anything is possible with God because even things that seem impossible are possible and God loves us and he wants to look after us and take care of us. And he used the little boy's lunch to help everybody else, to feed thousands of people. And he can use you too. It doesn't matter how little you are, he can use you. If you are kind and you share like that little boy, who knows how God can use you? In the Bible, somewhere else, not on with this story, it does say, for there is nothing that God cannot do. For there is nothing that God cannot do. And he likes to work through us. He likes to work through the grown-ups, but he likes to work through the children as well. Now, for our craft today, we're doing a really um, little paper craft. It's very simple. We're going to make a basket like this, and we're going to put in it some loaves and fishes and um, I don't know whether you can tell but this is actually an envelope. You know how you send envelopes when you write letters? So what you do is you lift up 
the envelope like that and can you see that I've drawn a line around that part? So I'm just going to show you with my scissors. Your grown-ups will help you to do this. I'm going to cut that bit off and here I'm just going to cut this little bit just to give it a little shape and around there and now I've got a sort of little basket you see a little basket shape and then I'm going to get my colours you can do this with any colours just if you want to make it into um, look like a sort of basket you see so I'm going to colour that bit and then I'm going to give this bit some lines to make it look a little bit like we've weaved a basket. And I think actually, that's right, I'll just do that with the corners as well and tape those down and then it looks a bit more like a basket shape, you see. And then we've got a pipe cleaner and we're going to make a handle for the basket like that. Now we need to make some loaves and some fishes. Now the little boy had how many? One, two, three, four, five loaves and two fishes. We made some fishes as well. So you could get your grown-ups to help you make some fish shapes and some loaves. But we've actually made some extras because of the miracle that Jesus performed when he said his prayer and he gave out the food to everybody. I haven't coloured these ones in yet, but look! I've got enough, well I haven't got enough for 5,000 people, but we're going to add those to the basket. So we're going to have lots and lots of loaves and fishes. <laughs> now I've got a little poem here, so I'm going to read you my little poem. And it's called More and More Fish. Little boy with his lunch, how can it feed such a bunch? One fish? No two fish. They will need a lot more fish. They can't afford to feed the hoard. So Jesus prays to the Lord and God gives them what they wish. Lots of bread and lots more fish. <laughs> Let's finish with our prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us and taking care of us. We know that you will take care of all our needs. All we have to do is ask you. Amen. See you soon. We're going to take an offering now. And as you know, we aren't able to do that in the usual way. There are details on screen of how you can give, but please get in touch if there are other ways that you would like to help. So as we pray, Lord, we thank you for the offering that we give this morning. Freely you gave your life for us, and so we thank you for the freedom to give back to you in this way. We pray that the offerings will be used to reach those who don't have as much as we, and that it might help bring health, safety, joy, and help further your kingdom throughout our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Three. The reading is taken from John chapter 19, verses 17 to 42. The crucifixion of Jesus. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had, noticed, had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 
Many of the Jews read from the sign, but the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claims to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarments remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be, special, to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it gave, has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tree, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Well, good morning, church. So, this piece of scripture is something that I have to say, if I'm honest, is something that I have been really nervous about preaching about. There's just so much kind of like uh, within this that, if I'm honest, makes me somewhat nervous. And, you know, I've been now a minister of a church for uh, over three years. And each time it gets to Easter, there's a moment within me that's excited because, well, let's face it, the Christian faith it kind of pivots, if you like, just on this moment where Jesus himself is crucified and he chooses to go through this. And as much as this is brutally painful, uh, this is, in essence, uh, the beginning, if you like, of the end, the beginning of the triumphant moment to which we look forward to, which is Christ's 
resurrection and what that means to humanity. But here we are, and there's the brutal way that Jesus dies, knowing that he goes through this for you and me, means actually this is something that I'm, I'm quite nervous about preaching about. And so as we go through this today, I really want you to, to try and allow yourself to see, to hear, to feel. You see, Jesus chose to go through this knowing it would be you and me who would benefit from this. So as easy as it might be for us to say, Phil, I've, I've heard the crucifixion story before. I know what this is about. Or I'm really not somebody who does well with, you know, graphic illustrations. And, and if that's the case, I still want you to try and feel it. Let's, let's, let's try and walk into this with uh, our, our eyes wide open, our ears ready to hear. And as we go through this, I want for us to feel uncomfortable. I want for us to feel pain. I want for us to feel sad. I want for us to be able to feel these emotions. Not because I want us to stay there, but because what I want for us to be able to understand is that Jesus went through this knowing that it meant salvation for you and me. So if we close our ears to it, we almost do him a misjustice in this. And I feel that this is kind of this is where we're going to be at today and I just want to kind of like talk through it just on a really honest uh, kind of way of being able to go through this so this is where we're at now if you have joined us today for the first time like welcome it's fantastic to have you with us we as a church have been working our way through for pretty much almost the last year now uh, John's gospel we are in chapter 20 we are purposefully taking our time going through this uh, to try and understand it now everything that John does has been kind of moving us towards this point where we are today uh, and this is almost like the the beginning of his grand finale so even though this the death of jesus which i would argue that majority of us as christians kind of understand the concept of why jesus died but the next part about like him being raised again to life which we're going to be looking at in the next couple of weeks or so like we we grasp that but it's almost like we find ourselves at the foot of the cross we're going to be spending a bit of time looking at that uh, in a couple of weeks but i want for us to like i said at the beginning of this just to kind of feel this so if this is new to you um today is going to be quite a serious sermon and it's purposeful because i want for us to be able to uh, kind of relive this because this helps us in our faith but if you want to understand some of the stuff that's come before this please do wade through our back catalogue which is available on both facebook uh, and on youtube and, and actually just kind of work through some of these things and i'm going to do a little bit of an overlap just as always just because it helps us remember where we've come from as we launch into this moment but um, today we're really looking at the actual, what we've just heard at that crucifixion moment. So we're in uh, chapter, um, we're in chapter 19. I say we're in uh, chapter 10, 20. We're not, we're actually in chapter 19 as we've just had uh, read to us. And this is the crucifixion. Now we looked uh, last week uh, at the idea of, of, of Pontius Pilate attempting to try and uh, get Jesus out of jail so that he didn't have to go through this because in Pilate's opinion, he didn't deserve this. If you were to read this across uh, the other gospels, uh, we also hear of him going to Herod and Herod finds no guilt in him as well. There's this kind of like sense of like literally, li listen guys, Jesus, did not deserve this death. We took a moment and we looked at Pontius, uh, how Pontius Pilate said, well, listen, you guys have got this uh, tradition. Let, let me put forward, um, you know, as a possibility. Why don't we say, listen, Jesus can go uh, free because um, at the Passover, I always let go one of your prisoners. And what happens? Some guy called Barabbas, guilty of the death penalty, is let free and we talked about how actually we are like Barabbas that sense that to be fair if we're honest you don't need me to sit down and go through your life 
uh, and go through your history, long term, short term, and tell you all the things that you know that you've done wrong in your life. Why? Because you already know. We know that we're guilty. And we found ourselves kind of going, actually, we resonate with Barabbas. Barabbas, you know, did not deserve to be set free. And, and as Jesus lovingly takes on all the wrongs that we've done and pays the penalty for it, that all of our wrongdoings, all of our sins, all the things that we've done that have hurt others and hurt ourselves and hurt God, that that slate is wiped clean. And, and this is what Jesus is inviting us to today. And we looked at how Barabbas was this guy who deserved it and suddenly finds himself. And we pondered, what would that mean to us? We looked at how Pilate, you know, tried desperately to get Jesus um, out of jail so that he wouldn't have to go through this and did. And like we talked about even in some of our lives, our own failures and the ways that we, we try our best, but still things don't go to plan. And our heart resonates with Pilate as we go, actually, I've been in similar situations where I've tried to do the right thing and actually I have done the right thing but yet still stuff has gone wrong we looked at just at the end of our sermon last week just looking at you know for those of us that have, have been witnessing to loved ones for years and they just never have made that and we can see that sometimes and go I failed God in this area you know I tried my best but yet still my kids haven't come to know God I tried my best but still my my spouse hasn't come to know God. I've tried my best, but still my, my work colleagues have not come to know God. I've tried my best, but I still feel like a failure. And we just looked at actually how Jesus knows us at our worst and still chooses to die on our behalf, just like Barabbas. So we're here today and we're actually looking at the death itself of Jesus. And here we find ourselves where Pilate has passed the sentence and uh, I'm going to go over certain aspects of this quite sort of quickly and then we're going to uh, press pause and we're going to just focus on a few moments. I also want to point out that actually none of this was a surprise. Part of the thing that we looked at last week was that at the exact moment that uh, the, the high priests are supposed to be uh, sorting out the sacrificial lamb for Passover, at the same time that that's happening, Jesus is getting ready to be taken to the cross to die. And we looked at the parallel that's between that, the fact that the Passover lamb, going back to the story of Egypt in Exodus and, and how at that moment, just as the uh, uh, the Passover, the, 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 the last final plague is about to happen, the firstborn of every household, both animal and human, both die. And, and, and this kind of almost like blanket moment across Egypt. Unless, unless, unless the Jewish people sacrifice a lamb. That lamb has to be spotless, has to be without blemish. And that, that the blood of that lamb using a hyssop branch is, is then uh, brushed over uh, the seams of the door. And in that moment, and in that moment, that house is then saved. And so that as the angel of death comes, he sees the blood of the lamb on the lint of the door and passes over that house. Judgment is not served on that house because of the blood of the lamb. And Jesus multiple times has been referenced as being the lamb of God. And I just think that that moment, this is, it's quite poignant that at the same time that the lamb's being prepared for the, for the, faso, for, for the Passover um, moment, that that sacrifice is about to happen. And here we have Jesus, the ultimate lamb going to be sacrificed for the sins of us all so that if we choose to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior his blood that sacrificial moment that he does that as he dies on that cross that the judgment of God passes over us because we are now redeemed and saved by his blood so one of the things that we need to be aware of is that 
our Old Testament, which is much bigger than the New Testament, right, actually just goes through and it's got so many echoes and so many moments where it's pointing forwards to what Jesus is about to do. And as God himself says, humanity is broken and there is no real redemptive force that will constantly mean that now humanity will no longer make mistakes. And so instead he has a plan and that plan has been uh, sowed into almost from creation itself so that God himself would come and would be the ultimate sacrifice. This is what Jesus is doing and so the, the way that we're going to look at this as we go through this together is we're going to take a look at, uh, at the story uh, that, that John gives us as we go through this. We're going to look at some of the things that happen and then we're going to take a look at some of the verses that historically go on, uh, that talk about all the stuff that's pointing forwards. We're going to take a look at the brutality of what he went through, knowing that it was for you and for me. Okay, so let's do this. So Jesus in chapter 19 uh, has already been taken away. And then in verse 17, we have him carrying the cross for himself. And as he does so, he takes it to a place which is called the place of the skull. Or uh, in Aramaic Hebrew, it's called Golgotha. If that word is translated into Latin, it's called Calvary. So the word that we quite often use when we're talking about Jesus going to Calvary, he's going to Golgotha, he's going to the place of the skull. There's a particular place uh, where... Uh, where the people are, are, are hung up on crosses uh, and, and it's almost it's it's suggested that even the the landscape has got like uh, an element that looks like a skull there they nailed him to the cross and two others were with him on either side and Jesus was between them then we've got this point where Pilate takes a sign and as he puts up the sign uh, that goes above his cross on that sign it says king of the Jews. Now this is the title that uh, the Jewish leaders had given him and said he claims to be king of the Jews. So if he's going to be crucified he has to be crucified for that because that's the only thing that they can pin on him is that it's worthy of death. Is that if he is king of the Jews, if he is king of the Jews, then he's standing up against Caesar in that particular region and saying that he's above Caesar in that particular region. And that's the only thing that Pilate can point on him. And it's not even something that Jesus has said himself. It's something that the religious leaders have called him. But watch what the religious leaders' response is. In verse 21, the leading priests object to it and say, change it from king of the Jews to he said, I am king of the Jews. And Pilate was like, no, you pinned this on him, that's staying where it is. You've got this moment where he says, no, what I have written, I have written. So the soldiers that had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among him, among the four of them, and then also took his robes, uh, and it was seamless. So what is this all about? Well, they basically take Jesus' clothes. We'll come to that, why they've got his clothes in a moment. But they take his clothes and they divide it among him. Uh, and then they get to his, uh, his actual garment itself, and it is classed as being seamless, which means that the way that he has been woven is all together with no seams. So what does this tell us? This tells us actually this piece of clothing that Jesus is wearing is an expensive piece of clothing. Uh, and, you know, I, I kind of like this because, it, it, because it's so nice, they don't want to divided among them. They don't want to tear it up and into four pieces, so they cast lots for it. What does that mean? Well, it basically means that they played a dice game for it and that the winner takes all. The winner takes the garment. Uh, and then that's what they did. Standing near, we then get uh, that Jesus' mother and a whole group of other ladies who all appear to be called Mary. Uh, and so we've got all these three different Marys that are there. Uh, and Jesus takes a look at his mother standing there and he says, Dear woman, here is your son. Talking about, well, we know this to be John. And then he says to John, 
here is your mother. Now, I just need to point out when he says, dear woman, okay, we talked about this quite a while back when uh, Jesus turns uh, water into wine. And there's uh, almost this cross reference here uh, is, is actually quite poignant in and of itself as well. But we've kind of got this moment where Jesus says to his mother, woman. Now, it's not a negative. Now, if I called my mum woman, I think my dad would have a few words to say about this. And that's not what's going on here. Actually, this is a, uh, a polite term in Hebrew that almost borderline distances himself a little bit. So he's still um, kind of giving uh, honour and credit to his mother, but at the same time, not calling mother, which is a up close personal term, but he's actually just taking a step back. And in him doing this, in this particular moment, this is where he says, I'm about to die. And therefore you will be uh, not necessarily childless, because we know that he's got brothers and sisters. We know James later on, Jude also, brothers of Jesus. But as the eldest, his mum is his responsibility, and he's passing on that responsibility to John. And so we've got this moment where, where Jesus is handing over that responsibility. I just love that, because even though he's in one of the most brutal places, he's dying a death that is horrendous, and we're going to look at some of that in a moment, but in that moment where it would be fine for him to just be inward looking at where he's at and the pain of it but he doesn't even in that moment he's filled with love and compassion for those around him and we know that John's there and we get this moment where he now passes the responsibility of his mum over to John and passes the responsibility uh, of, of all of that to each other I love that. So I'm going to press pause here. We're going to take a, a little bit of a look um, at the, the, the next few bits uh, in a moment. But I just want to kind of take a look at just the brutality uh, of the crucifixion itself. So I've had this conversation with people over uh, the years. Actually, what, what is crucifixion? Uh, and over the years, it's baffled many people who have done deaths, penalties as being something that's relatively quick. Uh, what it is about crucifixion? I mean, because there are definitely more physically brutal ways to die. I mean, the Romans were forever trying to dream up new and impressive ways to kill people for the sake of the audience looking at stadiums. And so, you know, documented, like the Romans were always dreaming up new stuff. But what is it about particularly crucifixion that made them be that their choice of death? Well, take a look at it. So the first one is, for, for one, the, the, when a, a person is hung on the cross, they are hung literally out uh, with their arms outstretched. Now, in its essence, by being hung down and all weight is upon, means that, uh, that your lungs are actually pressed down. So it's, it's very difficult to be able to take a full breath. And so in order to be able to take a full breath would mean that actually you are pulling yourself up to breathe. So how does crucifixion kill? It's through asphyxiation, which is being uh, stifled of breath until eventually you die. Suffocation. So what makes this such a horrendous form of death is who's in charge of how quickly the individual dies. It's the individual themselves. When they no longer have strength to be able to push up to breathe, then they die. So it was known for crucifixion to sometimes take multiple days until somebody finally died. So what's the purpose of this? Well, if we note where Jesus was taken, this is on the main road coming in and out of Jerusalem. The Roman Empire would often, outside big cities, crucify quite often many. And we're talking sometimes hundreds of people. 
It was a way of the Romans saying, if you mess with us, this is what awaits you. A long, undignified, brutal death, where everybody coming in and out of the city will be reminded, you don't mess with the Romans. That's the purpose. So the crucifixion itself, that's how you die. And quite often, uh, underneath um, the, 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 the person, the individual who's been uh, crucified would be a piece of wood for them to use to push it up. It's to actually elongate the length it takes for someone to die. Okay, so let's take a, a bit more of a look at the crucifixion. We know that Jesus was nailed to a cross. We know that the, the nails went through uh, hands and feet. Feet. What's worth noting here is uh, that this is to intensify the pain process. Sometimes they would merely just tie rope and hold them up, uh, and other times uh, they would literally nail straight through the flesh. Now, why the hands? Well, actually, if we were to look at it, uh, if you were to pierce a, a nail through the hand and then try and suspend somebody from it, the sheer body weight would eventually tear the nail through and it would come out between the fingers. So that's not the way that they would do it. Actually, it would go through the wrist, but quite often uh, in Hebrew and particularly uh, in um, uh, Aramaic, um, that the, the word for hand is actually this region here. And so actually it would go through the wrist and it would go between the radius uh, and the ulna, which, uh, and so in doing so that the, the wrist itself would be the point that would cause the nail to not be able to go any further. So we know that Jesus actually was crucified with nails going through his wrists and again, uh, just above the ankles, uh, exactly the same process. So in order to be able to pull yourself up, you are pulling yourself up using the nails as leverage. Think of the sheer level of pain that would be sent, almost like electric shocks through the body, and that's just to breathe. This is about causing mass pain, and the person who is inflicting the pain is the individual themselves in order to be able to breathe. This is cruel, and it's supposed to be cruel. So they would start off by uh, putting the nails in on the floor. So the cross would be laid out, a hole would be dug in order to be able to drop the, uh, the cross into it, but you couldn't nail somebody whilst the cross was up because uh, everything is against them and that person is more than likely going to be fighting to not be crucified. So they would do this on the floor uh, and they would stretch out the arms to the correct points and then they would ride the nails straight through. And then once that person was nailed, then using ropes, they would bring up the cross to the point where it was ready and then it would be dropped into the hole and that very moment would mean that the the, the all of those uh, uh, pain points where the nails go through that the whole body would writhe as that cross was dropped into place this is horrific it's supposed to be what else do we know? Well, I mentioned about the clothes. Well, if the soldiers have got the clothes, what's Jesus wearing? Now, we like, particularly from the artistic perspective, to at least tie a bit of a loincloth around Jesus's waist, because then we don't have to see him in all of his, we use the term glory, but in his fullness, his entire humanity, all on display. But the reality was, why would the Romans go to such an effect to provide such a horrendous place of death, all about shame, all about pain, and then give him a loincloth? That was not true. Jesus was hung naked on a cross. This, again, is another way of him showing it. Uh, about them showing just really uh, the level of contempt that they had. This is the Roman people showing uh, the level of contempt that they had for the individual that was being crucified. So this is why the, 
the, the Roman soldiers at the foot of the cross are arguing over his clothing. Guys, can we begin to see what this is about? So let's move on. And then we're going to come back to some of that in a moment. So Jesus, I love this, in verse 28, John says, Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. And a jar of sour wine was sitting there. So they soaked it in a sponge, put it on a hyssop branch. Notice that word, on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When Jesus tasted it, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit okay just want to press pause on that for a moment so we've got several things that are going on here that i want to point out first of all jesus knows that he's about to die jesus knows that that what he's done it's accomplished all of his life has been pointing to this moment he knew who was going to go through it and he knew why he was going to go through it. And as he says, I am thirsty, there's a jar of, jar of sour wine. Now, across the various different gospels, that in itself appears in different types. What the sour wine was for, is like some argue it was a form of painkillers. Some say that as it was offered, he refused it. Others said that, uh, that he allowed it to touch his lips. But there's another aspect that's here as well, is what, what's a sponge? doing here um, and I learned this from the wonders of uh, the children's show uh, horrid histories but we have a garrison of soldiers that are up on the side of that hill and so uh, in order for them to be there there has to be a latrine of some form for them to be able to use uh, and toilet paper I might add is a very relatively new thing and particularly back then, a sponge would be used, left in a bucket, so that uh, they would use that to clean themselves. And so the concept of the sponge, where was the sponge? M many uh, historians believe that the sponge that Jesus was used, this is another way of ridiculing Jesus, was, oh, he's thirsty, quick guys, let's grab the sponge. Like Jesus does this. And as that sponge is then soaked in bitter wine, not even the good stuff, but like bitter stuff. Jesus, as it touches his lips, gives him just enough liquid in his throat to be able to shout out that victory cry. And as he shouts out, it is finished. He dies. He says that he gives up his spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit, but this is his physical spirit in this moment he dies let's move on okay so in verse 31 we hear that this is uh, the day of preparation so this is as we were looking at it before the day where they they prepare for the lamb to be sacrificed that the Jewish leaders did not want the body still hanging there for the next day, which is the Sabbath. And it's not just any Sabbath, but this is the ultimate Sabbath of the Jewish faith system. This is the Passover. So we've kind of got this moment where they don't want that to be hung out. And this is to do with uh, a verse uh, in Leviticus. And, and we looked at this uh, just uh, a few uh, weeks back and the the idea uh, that that a, a body uh, that has been uh, um, hung out um, cannot be left out because it defiles the land uh, and so therefore once the person is dead they should be put uh, um, taken down from that so it doesn't defile the land and so because they want to make sure that that's the case uh, they go to um, uh, to pilot and ask for the deaths to be hastened now this would happen only a very few times. Like I said, the, the Romans liked the idea of people being hung for quite often days, sometimes even weeks, as a reminder to the people that they are under the thumb. But Pilate recognizes that this is a big deal. 
Uh, we also see, uh, historically speaking, in other documents, that when it was the emperor's birthday, quite often all the dead and those that were dying would be sped up so that there wouldn't be death um, being displayed on an important day. And so they've kind of used that as an excuse to be able to say, we have done this in the past, like we don't want for that to be the case. So they would go and uh, we see here, uh, so their legs would be broken and their bodies could be taken down. What's that all about? Well, as their legs are broken means they are no longer able to push with their legs to be able to push themselves up in order to be able to take breaths, which means the only physical way to be able to do that is on their arms, by which time these guys are exhausted. And so asphyxiation comes quicker. And we note here that when they came to Jesus to break Jesus's legs, they find that he's actually already dead. So one of the soldiers takes hold of a spear. Again, these are soldiers. They just grab something that's near to hand. And as they stab his side, just underneath his ribs, they see that actually that in doing so, that this is no longer blood that is being pumped around the body, that now it's no longer being pumped around. And so the blood starts to separate into blood and water which tells you that the heart stopped beating, which tells you that Jesus is already dead. So this is a way of them seeing without having to, you know, pull him down and check if he's still breathing, see if he's still got a pump, see if he's still got a heartbeat. Just that stab alone will do this. And then um, at that moment, they know this. So, and then they pull him down. Now, there's a lot here that talks about fulfillment of scripture. In fact, John goes through and actually references this. Now, I wanna encourage you at home, if you've got a piece of pen and paper, I just want you just to make some notes. I'm gonna just throw a load of Bible verses at you. And over this next week, I just wanna encourage you in your quiet time, just to go through and read some of these for yourself so that you can see that this is not a surprise, that this is not some crazy mistake, but this is purposeful. See, as John is writing this, he writes this in such an incredible way. I mean, I would argue that the, the best form of um, uh, flies, the best form of any form of novel or any form of book is that if it's written in a way that that means that you've all these storylines that you're seeing they're all beginning to come in together and everything that you kind of expected suddenly it goes wrong and and, and then you, you're watching it and you've got this kind of sense of despair and then suddenly it all clicks and the moment where the, an ending comes that you didn't quite see coming that is a good story you know what as John pulls all of this together, he's doing just that. We're looking here and we're seeing that all of this just feels wrong. All of this just feels brutal. And, and if I was reading this for the first time, and because as Christians, our faith is built upon this, we already know. But imagine as you're reading this for the first time, you'd feel like this is wrong. And John is explaining, you know what? This fulfills scripture time and time again, which means that that God himself has been writing this into all of the historical books so that when it happens, you go, God, this is a crazy plan that you've had in the making for thousands of years. And that is exactly what is happening. So grab your pen grab your paper. We're going to go through and I'm just going to read a few and this isn't all of them but this is from John's gospel. So this is how in just John's he is fulfilling all of these scriptures. Okay so let's go for this. In, Deut in uh, Leviticus 24 verse 14 it prophesies how um, the, 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 when the people were to die, that they were to be taken out of the city and that even that the, the Messiah would die outside of the city. In Psalm chapter 22, uh, verse 16, it says that he will be in the company of evildoers. In Isaiah 53 verse 12 it says that he would be numbered with the transgressors he would be numbered with those who sinned 
I love this. So these are all mess messianic verses that are talking about the Messiah, who we know as Jesus, which means that not one of these moments, not one of these facts is a mistake, which means he knew he was going to do this. This is the plan that Jesus himself, God, who, who was being planning this from the beginning, brings this into being. Psalm 22, the most quoted uh, section of scripture. Um, John just quotes it all the way through. The other gospels quote it all the way through. Why? Because it's almost like it's a poem uh, written by David nearly a thousand years before talking about what Jesus was going to go through. So we've got this, this moment where uh, David is going through and he talks about how he would be pierced, talks about the clothing, talks about the death, even talks about the thirst. Like, challenge you guys, over this week, read Psalm 22. In Psalm 69 verse 21, it talks that he is offered sour wine to drink. Even just that one moment was prophesied nearly a thousand years before. We mentioned at the beginning the idea of the hyssop plant being used. That, and, and actually, if, if you look up what is the hyssop plant, it is a bush that can grow in pretty much any circumstances to the point that it can even grow in the crack of a building. And it is essentially, it's a bush, but it's, uh, it, it's got like quality to it, which just makes it quite robust. And so this one thing that is used for the Passover is then used for Jesus. I just love that there's an, an element of that with it too. This last Easter, uh, on um, on the run up, we, we spent time just looking uh, at Isaiah chapter 53. And again, this is called the suffering servant. Uh, and, and in Isaiah 53, it just goes through. And Isaiah pretty much foretells majority of what Jesus is going to go through to the point we discussed that actually, if you were to read it and had no idea of timeline, you would be presumed for believing that it was written after Jesus's death, explaining who Jesus was explaining what he went through. But it was written hundreds and hundreds of years before. Like, just grab hold of that for a moment. Like, I, I love this. And this is not an accident. Like, he knew that this would be the case. In um, Deuteronomy chapter 21 verses 22 to 23 describes how uh, a hanged man has to be brought down, um, that it must not be left out. And so here we see a man hanging on a tree on a cross who his body has to be brought down. In Psalm 34 verse 20. In Exodus chapter 12 verse 46. In Romans chapter 9 verse 12, it describes in all of these how the Passover lamb's bones were not to be broken. Jesus, the ultimate Passover lamb, his, not a single bone was broken. Note even if they'd have tried to crucify him through his hands, the likelihood is they would have broken a bone. If your man had missed when he was stabbing him, broke one of his ribs, it would have broken but so many of these details just seem insignificant until you take a look at it and go whoa and then in Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 it says how they looked upon the one they had pierced and we see the soldiers standing at the foot of the cross, looking up at Jesus, who has just died. And he gave up his own spirit. He decided when he was going to die. I love this. And they're bewildered. This is not something they've seen before. They were expecting to have to break the bones. This was going to be a quick crucifixion. And Jesus has already died. But he did it in his own way and said, it is finished. And then died. Even that's too big to understand. And the Roman soldiers looking up are in bewilderment as they see this. Guys, can I just point out, before we go any further, before we look at uh, the, the latter part, 
Like Jesus knew. Like all of this, as painful and as horrendous as it was, it was foretelling everything that was mentioned in the Old Testament. Like all of that is pointing forwards to this moment where Jesus dies. And I'm not even looking at the rest of the Gospels. I'm just looking at John. I mean, we could do like several weeks worth of just looking at how Jesus fulfills scripture. And you could say, well, yeah, well, they've just kind of like pulled verses to make them mean different things. Can I point out the Old Testament is the Septuagint. This is the, 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 the scripture that is used by Jewish people today who are still waiting on their Messiah. So we can't twist the Old Testament to make it into something else, because if we do so, then it's, it's, it's stark comparison to what the Jewish people are using. No, th these scriptures are in their religious literature and they're waiting for their Messiah to come. And here is Jesus. And as he dies, he fulfills all of these through what just feels like this is just the way that history is going. And then we take a step back and go, wait, all of this was foretold? That's incredible. And the last part about this is we looked uh, at the idea that afterwards, um, you know, we got this this rich guy called Joseph of Arimathea who goes over uh, to, to, to Pilate and says, can, can I have the body of Jesus so I can give him a proper burial? And they're trying to get this done before the sun goes down. Why does it matter before the sun goes down? Well, the Jewish um, days and nights are slightly different to ours. They would say that uh, a day begins as one day finishes as the sun goes down that marks the beginning of the next day so they need to get Jesus uh, quickly down from the cross before the sun goes down because as soon as the sun goes down it becomes the Sabbath and they're not allowed to do anything on the Sabbath so we've got this moment where like it's it, it, they're trying to get this done as quickly as possible and uh, Joseph of Arimathea puts Jesus inside his own tomb that was prepared for him and this is, a, is a, an exuberant like it's a pricey kind of grave we know that there's a gardener like how many people can afford to have a grave at a grave site that's got a gardener that has got a massive stone that's rolled over the front of it it's been hewn out of the the rock face itself this is an expensive grave this is not something Jesus could have afforded he's given a rich man's burial and look at the sheer quantity of stuff that has been brought so uh, 75 pounds that works out as about 32.7 kilograms that's a lot of this particular ointment that has been brought this is a rich man's burial and if you were to read uh, in Isaiah's 53 verse 9 it talks about how his death was among the wicked and we see the two criminals either side yet his burial was that of a rich man. Note even the little details here fulfill scripture prophesied hundreds, even thousands of years before. Like guys, this is incredible. So what does all of this mean? What does this mean to you and me? Well, let's look at this. Jesus knew like he'd written it into the scriptures of the Old Testament, almost himself. Like he got this essence that that as as um, as each of these guys are prophesying, God is like revealing aspects of what's going to happen in the future. God, who at the beginning of John's gospel, we read, clothes himself in flesh and comes to dwell among humanity. Like Jesus is God all the way through. He talks about him and the father being one so god clothes himself in flesh so that he would go to the cross to die a death he did not deserve to die a death that he was not guilty for to die a death in the place of a man who was guilty to die a death so that you and i might know life he took on the ultimate shame and the ultimate pain and he did it for you as he laid on the cross naked 
He did it for you. As that nail was driven through his wrists, he did it for you. As the cross was lifted up and dropped into the hole, as the pain rippled through his body, he did it for you. As he hung there, naked, wrapped in shame, wrapped in the sin of the world, he did it for you. As he raised his body on the instruments of pain wrapped through his wrists in order to be able to declare that final statement, he did it for you. And in that statement, he shouted, it is finished. And in that moment, everything he went through, everything he did, was brought into a moment of victory as he died for you and for me. He did this for you. This is the beauty of this story and he knew it from the beginning. What is our response? Our response can only be one thing, in gratitude and thankfulness, as we take our shame that he went to the cross for, it dies with him at the cross. When we look at all the wrongs that we have done, all of the sin that we carry, all of the things that we have done that have hurt others, hurt ourselves and hurt God, it dies with him at the cross. And so, instead of it being us that we see up on that cross, it's him, the beautiful one, God clothed in flesh as he did this for you. So as Jesus lay down his life for you and for me, our response is as we say to God, I need you. We lay down our lives and say, God, we want to live for you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we stand here together, metaphorically at the foot of your cross, together in dotted in homes around the place, together as a church, we should be looking up at ourselves. We do not deserve to be brought into a perfect world. We do not deserve to go to heaven. We do not deserve that because as soon as we do, all that's perfect of heaven becomes imperfect because we are there. Yet you chose to clothe yourself in flesh and therefore by doing so have taken all of our wrongs so that now we can enter into your courts lord with pure hearts and clean hands why because our wrongs died with you two thousand years ago lord this morning some for the first time I'm coming back to you. We say, Lord, we can't do this on our own and we need you. Lord, our lives are yours. May we live for you. Amen. There's a place Mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. 
So this brings us to the end of our service this morning. We hope you've enjoyed spending this time with us, worshipping together, listening to the children's talk and doing the crafts, and listening to the words that Phil brought to us. We thank you so much for joining us. As usual, there'll be an after church social on Zoom straight after the live service goes out. So please check the Facebook comments for the meeting details if you'd like to join us and everyone is welcome to do so. So let's pray as we close our service. Father God, we thank you for loving us so much that you gave your one and only son to die for us, to give us freedom of eternal life that we don't deserve 
but that you give to anyone who asks for it. Thank you also for the freedom to be able to continue to meet together like this and worship you in this way, even when the world looks so different, Lord. And we pray for a safe return to be being able to meet together in person again in our church. We pray for those who are unwell, those recovering from illnesses, or those mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray for your peace and rest on these hurting hearts. And we pray that your light might shine through us to help those who continue to suffer in the weeks ahead. We pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>